Hello, 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 hello. Welcome, welcome back. We're going to talk today about uh, uh, length and angle measure. But first, I want to do another quick example of some look back questions. Some questions about the previous section that will, I hope, give a person some sense of whether they know what's going on. So, uh, so for starters here, we have these three. So the first one is, what is a linear equation? So if you have an x plus 2y plus 3z equals 4, or a minus x plus 2y minus z equals 1, what does that represent geometrically? So, uh, of course, in doing the homework, and, uh, and, and because the materials review probably from previous classes, you recognize that x plus 2y plus 3z equals 4 is, uh, strictly speaking, is a one equation linear system one equation linear system with two free variables y and z so you can express x in terms of y and z it's it's not very hard you can express x in terms of y and z and so you get a solution set that looks like particular vector plus y times a vector plus z times a vector so again x plus 2y plus 3z equals 4 or the other one is a linear system with uh, one equation so we know what the solution set looks like, and the solution set looks like the equation that we saw last time for a plane. So x plus 2y plus 3z equals 4 is some kind of plane in 3 space. It's a two-dimensional flat surface in 3 space. And likewise, minus x plus 2y minus z equals 1 is also a, a flat two-dimensional surface inside of 3 space. Okay. So that's why we're interested in, that's why we call the, the course linear algebra, because it's about these linear things. What are the possibilities, question two, what are the possibilities for the intersection of two planes? So really the point of this question is to have a person think about, uh, in your head, you, know, you imagine two planes, people, some people are better at uh, imagining these kind of things than others, but still, two planes, you you, it's like two pieces of paper. If you lay two pieces of paper out in space, what can happen to those two pieces of paper? Well, it seems to me there's a limited number of cases. If you have two planes, it can be the case that the two planes are parallel. That could happen. It only happens in a special case, that, uh, uh, but nonetheless, it could happen that the two planes are parallel and never touch. The other possibility is that it can be that the two planes are canted at some kind of angle to each other, and so, in fact, the two planes touch, and when they touch, they meet in a line. It's not possible for two planes to intersect in exactly two points. It's not possible for two planes to intersect in exactly one point. If two planes intersect, they have to intersect either in zero points, meaning that they're parallel planes, or else in a line, in infinitely many points. And then, of course, question three is the three planes. What can happen? So if we have three planes, which we're, we're linking in our mind with three linear equations, if we have three planes, what can happen? Why, it can be the case that uh, two or maybe all three of them are parallel to each other. That can happen. So there is, in fact, no common intersection to the three planes. That, that, that could happen. A more likely case, though, is that the three planes intersect in the following way, that two of the planes intersect in a line, and then the third plane cuts that line. So that you find one point, a single unique point, a co common point for the three planes to intersect. And then the last thing that can happen, and again, it probably strikes a person as unlikely, but doesn't mean you couldn't make up an example of it, is the first two planes intersect in the line that we just had a second ago, and the third plane also happens to share that line, so all three planes intersect in that line. So the two cases, the cases of uh, where the three planes are parallel, might strike you as being not very typical, as being a little bit unusual, a little bit off the beaten path. You said, well, you'd have to set the system up very specially in order to have that happen. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. And likewise, to have the three planes intersect in a single line, you say, well, that, if you're just going to throw three planes into space, you wouldn't think that would happen. Yes, yes, very true. And then the third case, that the three planes intersect in a single point, two of the planes intersect at a line, and then the third plane cuts the line. That's kind of, you say to yourself, that's kind of the, the you know, the, the, the case that I kind of expect to happen most of the time. Yeah, that's right. We used the word non-singular before. But anyway, that's kind of, the, kind of the random case that you think would happen most often. Okay. All right. So let me, uh, let me go to... To today's material on length and angle measure, and again, I'm anticipating that 
the uh, that the the material for today is largely a review that you probably had it before in some other math class like calculus three, or else you might have had it in in say a physics class or some other class like that. that um, and so we're going to go through it uh, 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 at a little bit more quickly than we go through material that we thought were, was entirely new to everybody. Okay, so the length, length of a vector. Length of vector is the Pythagorean length. You take the, uh, you square each of the components and then you take the square root. You square each of the components, sum them up and take the square root. We use absolute value bars for length here just because absolute value bars are the general symbol that you use in mathematics to indicate magnitude or size of, and so that makes sense for length of a vector. And just as an example, the length of minus one, minus two, minus three works out to be 14. Notice that the negative signs do not matter. You don't run into trouble with length when the vector points in the negative direction or any such thing that squares make the negatives go away. So the uh, the length of this particular vector is the square root of 14, which is not a very you know not a very particularly handy number. You ought, it will often be the case that we want to uh, take vectors that are of kind of an arbitrary length, like square root of 14, and um, resize them to make them be of length 1. So we'll take this vector and come up with a new vector that has length 1 for a size. And the right way to do that, that's called normalizing the length. The right way to do that is to divide the vector by its size. In this case, I will multiply v by 1 over the square root of 14. Multiply v by 1 over the square root of 14. See the length of v on the bottom of that fraction. And we end up with, with a square root of 14 on the bottom of each of those three fractions. And when you do the calculation, minus 1 over the square root of 14 quantity squared, minus 2 over the square root of 14 quantity squared, minus 3 over the four, square root of 14 quantity squared, and you add them all up and take square root, you end up with 1, which is which is what I wanted. So normalizing is how you turn a vector and get, start with a vector and get a new one whose length is 1. And it works as long as the original vector is not the zero vector. Of course, if you tried to divide the zero vector by its own length, you'd find yourself, find yourself somewhere where you don't want to be. Okay, I want to introduce an operation. Again, I'm anticipating that this is review for folks. So, um, so I introduce in some, you know, in, in not really, not really telling the truth sense. This operation is called the dot product. Uh, sometimes inner product, sometimes called scalar product. Authors call them different things in this context. Of two n component real vectors, they have to have the same number of components. Dot product of two n component real, ve real vectors is you take their components, first components, second components, third components, you multiply the components, multiply together the first components, multiply together the second components, etc., down to multiplying together the nth components, and then you add the result. In this book, I'm writing it with kind of a bold faced dot. That's just um, uh, you know, just a convention that I've adopted. It, you can't write a bold face dot on the whiteboard, so so there's you know only so much a person can do there. But I do think that the making the dot especially dark helps to helps a person to remember that it's not regular multiplication, not scalar multiplication, it is instead some different operation. A person could tell, of course, because they're vectors that it isn't scalar multiplication. But anyway, I, I've adopted this kind of darker dot that you won't necessarily see in other books. And it's not hard here to, to do the operation. 1 times 3, 1 times minus 3, minus 1 times 4, add them all up. Turns out it adds to minus 4 in this case. And the thing to notice about the result is that when you take two vectors and combine them in this way, you don't get a vector, you get a scalar, which is why it's often called scalar product. Okay, and then the other thing to notice with the dot product is that if you take the dot product of a vector with itself, you get the vector's length. The, uh, uh, the importance of dot product is that it tells us something about the spaces that we're interested in, about the linear spaces that we're interested in, and uh, this result really gives you the, gives you the central, central core of the idea here, is that um, if you have two vectors, uh, u and v, in, uh, in real n space, so you have available the, the dot product, then the, the length of u plus v is less than or equal to the length of u plus the length of v. And this picture really tells you what you want to know here. The length of u plus v, so that's the length of u plus v right there, that's the darker of the two vectors, is less than or equal to the length of u plus the length of v, and of course that person recognizes it probably because it's written on the slide, that the shortest distance between two points is in a straight line. So that, that, that's called the triangle inequality for the obvious reason because you, you illustrate it by drawing a triangle, but it uh, says something about how spaces work. It says that spaces are flat in some sense. 
the proof of the triangle inequality, you can find all kinds of proof of them uh, all, over the, all over the internet, for example, if you Google, but I, I chose a particular one that I want to illustrate something. So um, because all of the numbers are positive, uh, I can square both sides here, and I don't have to worry about changing the direction of the inequality. So I took the length of u plus v and squared it, and I took the length of u plus the length of v and I squared it, and I, from the previous slide, uh, I remember that the length of a vector, the length of u plus v in this case, the length of a vector squared is equal to the vector dotted with itself. And here, when you square, uh, when you square a plus b, you get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, and so I just multiply that out. And then you go on and do some algebra. It turns out, we haven't given it as a lemma, but it's one of the exercises. It turns out that you can you can distribute the dot over the plus sign here and get u dot v, excuse me, u dot u and u dot v, and v dot u and v dot v. And likewise here, length u quantity squared is u dot u, length v quantity squared is v dot v. You see that the u dot u and the u dot u cancel. You see that the v dot v, oops, there it is, the v dot v and the v dot v cancel. And when all the smoke clears, we've got 2 times u dot v, the u dot v and the v dot u give the same answer. 2 times u dot v is equal to 2 times length u, length v. Of course, you can cancel the 2's to get uh, u dot v is less than or equal to, I said equal to a minute ago, forgive me, I'm sorry, less than or equal to, u dot v is less than or equal to uh, length u, length v. Remember, u dot v is a scalar, so less than or equal to makes sense. I want to show that that's true. And so uh, I'm going to pull the following trick. This part up here, it was all perfectly routine, sort of plug and chug stuff. But now I'm going to pull a trick that probably would not occur to a person right off the top of their head. I'm going to multiply both sides by the non-negative numbers, length of u and length of v. And then I'm going to group it in a way that you wouldn't think to group. And, and that's, so there's a trick here. And, uh, but it, it gives me this. I'm interested in this inequality along the way, so I need that trick. I'm taking length v multiplied by u and length u multiplied by v. And here I have 2 times the length u squared and length v squared. And then I rewrite the whole thing by moving everybody to one side of the equation. You recognize that that's the equation for a square. And you recognize that it's got to be true because when you square something, when you, you've got to get a positive. So this must be true, and since it's equivalent to what's at the top of the screen, that the th thing at the top of the screen is true. But again, my main interest in the proof is that along the way, I ended up bumping up against this inequality. The fact that the equality holds only, uh, only when uh, the length u times v minus the length v times u is, is, the, is a zero vector, and uh, that can only happen in the case that one vector is a, is a, a multiple of the other. For example, if v is uh, length v over length u multiplied by u. And I mentioned a number of times here is that I, I was keen on this inequality here, so that's why I, um, th that's why I did that particular proof. And the, uh, the, the, it came up in the, in the course of the triangle inequality, so I was interested in it for that purposes. That was, that was a reason to go through that particular proof of the triangle inequality. Okay, so I said I was going to do length and angles. We're going to need angles at some point, so that fits with length, so we're throwing it in here. So the angle between two vectors is given by that equation. Oops, my mouse is in the way. If the angle between two vectors is given by that equation. You take u dot v, you divide by length u, length v, and you recognize that stuff appeared in the triangle inequality. I mean, it's all tied together, and then you want to you view that as the cosine of the angle you want. So if you have two vectors like u and v in space here, to find the angle between them, the cosine of that angle, <coughs> pardon me, the cosine of that angle is this expression here. And the basic idea is that if neither one of them is a multiple of the other, then they form a plane. You bring them down to start at the origin, and they form a plane. And in that plane, you can apply whatever stuff you remember from high school trigonometry. And one thing you might remember from high school trigonometry is the law of cosines. Do you remember the law of cosines? <laughs> Probably not, but it, but, but it rings a little bit of a bell. It's the generalization of the of Pythagorean theorem to non 
right angles. There we go. There's the law of cosines. And uh, I'm not going to go through the details here. It's basically the same sort of stuff. You cancel the sides. And, um, and it gives you the expression that I had on the previous screen. That expression, the expression on the previous screen, that expression on the previous screen here is, uh, uh, tells you that um, th has the special case for when they, when they form a right angle. So the two, the two uh, vectors are perpendicular. They form a right angle, orthogonal. Perpendicular, they form a right angle, if and only if their dot product is zero. So the only way that you get uh, a right angle in this expression is if the top of the fraction is a zero. And of course, they're uh, they're parallel only in the other case. Okay, so that uh, that expression from for the angle here tells you when they're perpendicular, and uh, we will not use it as often. But it also tells you when they're parallel. Okay. Okay, that's the um, that's that's the material on length and angles. There we go. And um, I will uh, I'll see you next time when we're going to talk about uh, an extension to to Gauss's method called Gauss-Jordan reduction. Okay, very good. Thank you. Bye bye.